I think we have about 15 minutes. Um, if people want to ask questions, I, I know that uh, this, well, you have so much more to talk about. This afternoon? This afternoon, I'm going to talk about the Graham organization, actually. Yeah, yeah yes. Uh -huh. so, so, so you can give us some more of that. Of course, this is a uh, ongoing and an amazing introduction to this history, which is just absolutely tremendous. Um, you were talking about conflict transformation yes. and conflict resolution. Yes. Right? Uh, can I ask the first question? You, you just mentioned very quickly. Could you give us a, I, I know it's not the first time, but you were doing something here, not trying to resolve a conflict, but trying to transform it. Could you explain for a couple yeah, of minutes? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, contributing to conflict transformation. Let, let me give you the difference between conflict resolution and conflict transformation. Um, can I just borrow this for a second? I'll just take, I'll just take your pen, that's fine. Um, what is your name again? Shada. Shada. Shada, okay. Let's say that I'm, I come in here and I see this pen here and I pick it up and I, I, I put it in my pocket and Shada comes up to me and she says, wait a second, that's my pen, you know? And I, and I say to her, no it isn't, it's my pen, you know? And I don't like the way you've been looking at me the whole time. You just, you're just the kind of person I can't stand, you know? And then, then, then she says, well, what's on the, what, what's the, what's, what does it say on the pen? I said, I don't know. She says, well, it says shot on the pen. I go, oh, boy. Oh, it is your pen. Conflict's resolved. Is the conflict resolved? I insulted her for no reason. The reality is that behind most conflicts, there are deep-seated feelings, disrespect, and the whole process is how do we address that type of thing, you know? Conflicts you're gonna always have, but the point is how do you transform those feelings in, in, a, in a positive way? So the basic issue of conflict resolution versus conflict transformation is actually, to be simple, I think it's a lot of what you're doing, it's healing hearts, finally. We have to be able to deal with the, the, ab the abuse that people have exposed each other to and that we want to try to address. Uh, the example of canceling hate America. <laughs> yes. You're transforming a whole relationship. You're definitely a professor, Professor Larry. I can see that. <laughs> uh, I talk too much. Anybody? Uh... Yes. So, so subsequent to, thank you. So thank you for your uh, expansive historical scope. I, I do appreciate that. So after that month was canceled that year, it was canceled the year after that again with President Clinton, and then and then tensions rose again. 1994. That was the that was the that was that was 1992. 1993, at the start of the of the Clinton presidency, it was canceled again. 1994, the the nuclear weapon issue be it, it shot way up again, and therefore you know the the, the problems and hostility you know it, it again emerged. And it was not canceled again until 2017 with Donald Trump, if you recall. And you saw what happened in, two, you know, in, in after, after, subsequent to that, the, uh, you know, the, I mean, I'm sorry, 2018. But subsequent to that, when things fell apart in, in Vietnam, they didn't, they didn't just cancel, they did not just continue with Hate America Month, but they also even blew up the center where a dialogue is supposed to be happening between North and South. So right now, no, right now they're, they're doing it. Thank you. Uh, conflict transformation and conflict resolution. Which one is more sustainable? Which one is what? Which one is more sustainable between conflict transformation and conflict resolution? Which one is more sustainable? In the sense that which one can guarantee uh, positive peace? Uh, conflict transformation, I believe. I think I, if you think if we think about conflict resolution. I mean, oftentimes, you know, people think, well, we, we, we resolved this now, but we didn't really resolve it. You know, there's so many situations where things are not resolved. I mean, uh, one of the issues that you're probably aware of, uh, which uh, I've done a lot of research on, is the, is the comfort woman issue between Japan and Korea, you know? Uh, there's a book by Alexis Dudden, teaches at the University of Connecticut, which is called Troubled Apologies. Um, Japan has apologized 20 some times about the comfort women issue. The comfort women issue, it, it deals with 
sexual slavery during World War II, and that Jap the Japanese used Korean and Taiwanese women, that's why I was in Taiwan, by the way, the Taiwanese women as sex slaves. And they then, uh, and then they, they, they said, oh, they were paid well, everything was, you know, there's no, there no issue. And then little by little, these women started to come out beginning in around 1990, and they began to tell their stories. There's very few of them left. There's maybe three or four alive still. Most of them have died. But uh, in Taiwan, they're all dead now, unfortunately. But the, the, their, stories start, their stories started to come out, you know. So, um, but the point I want to make is that problem was solved, solved uh, back in 1960 when President Park Chung-hee signed an agreement with the Japanese government saying all complaints, all issues have been solved because we are now giving you, I think, the, I think it was $800 million. We we're giving you a huge amount of money they, they, they granted to them. And so, you know, President Park Chung-hee signed and the problem was solved, but it wasn't really solved. You know, the, the point is that these people have to be heard and people have to, have to not just apologize, but take responsibility for what was done, you know. So that, that whole process is a process of healing, you know. The, the, mo the most difficult things is that people's hearts aren't healed, you know. And uh, that, that, that takes time, you know. It takes time, you know. In the, in, the case, in the case of the Holocaust, you know, uh, dealing with the, the situation with Germany and Israel, um, I forget, I don't know how many billions of dollars the German government has given to Israel. And, and, and Israel would, would sometimes say, well, maybe that's enough. And the German government would go, no, it's not enough. No, it's not enough. You know? Somehow this whole, it, they, they feel, we haven't solved this. It's not addressed. So. The key is to turn a conflict into another kind of relationship. That's it. Yep. Um, this is fascinating mm -hmm. that Billy Graham or uh, um, Sun Myung Moon, I mean, for a communist, I mean, to deal with somebody like that with respect. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I, I don't know if you can talk to me about the psychology here. I mean, Marxism is science, right. and religion is, mm. you know, the, it, 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 it's just to fool the masses. Uh, how do you, how do they get, the, or, or are they just using religion because we have to have some way to talk to these people, uh, because if we talk to them politically up here, it's going to, it, it won't work. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, the, the reality is, I think both in the case of the Moon Organization and the Graham Organization, they know we may be being used. They know that. We may be being used. But the point is that uh, by, by doing it, there is communication that's going on. If not, I mean, uh, you, you get back to this official thing, get rid of your weapons. Get rid of them. You know, you're, you know, we, otherwise, we're taking steps. We're just warning you there's this time and don't, nothing else. Somehow, the North Koreans were wise enough to understand around, around, uh, around the time that the reality of their missile pro program became evident. By the way, can I just say a few things about that very quickly? The North Koreans will not easily give up their weapons. Why? Because they can't forget Gaddafi. They talk about Gaddafi all the time. Gaddafi ceded his weapons he was promised a certain kind of protection, and it lasted for eight years before finally he was, you know, uh, brutally, brutally brought down. And, and the countries that had kind of made assurances to him, they all turned on him. So there, you know, there's no question that in, in terms of, 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 of North Korea, it's the same thing. So they understand that situation. So getting back, I mean, getting back to the whole matter, they knew just dealing officially on this issue, we, we're, we have no time. So let's try to find some other people to talk to and reach out. Let's try to find ways to have some more time. Let's use some track to diplomacy, let people be able to kind of share our cause rather than just get rid of your weapons, understand why we're doing what we're doing, you know, how we got to where we, we, we are. And I, I, uh, I mean, I'll talk more about it this afternoon. I think Franklin Graham has tried to do a lot of that to try to help people to understand the North Korean mentality, if you will, their approach to things. Yes, ma'am. So I do have a question because I just recently read a, a book by Sabine Atasir talking about the really bottom-up approaches towards uh, transformation or conflict transformation. So when you call 
these examples more of a bottom-up approach? Yes, absolutely. That's what they are. They're really, they're basically, that, that's a perfect way to put it. They are that. Basically, um, they are, you know, like, like, like uh, President Kim Il-sung, when, when Billy Graham came back in 1994, what he said to him was, I'm so, I, t to me, you feel like family to me. You, you know, ba basically the whole thing is start, you know, do you, I think we all know, you know, if, it doesn't matter if there's somebody from a different religion, from a different race, from a different ethnicity, you know, you meet one person like that and you make a bond with that person and it completely changes you. And you look at everybody else from that particular ethnicity or religion or race completely different because it changes something in you from that point. Yes, Shani. I have uh, one question from the board. That's my pen, by the way. No. <laughs> yeah. You don't that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one from the virtual participant. Tudor has a question. Can we pursue conflict resolution and conflict transformation as parallel processes? Yeah, we can. But, we, but I think we have to know that conflict resolution does not guarantee conflict transformation. Yeah, yeah. And we have, we have to know that basically unless, unless that, those, those deep, swollen, ugly feelings inside of us are resolved, conflict's not over, even if we've signed on the dotted line. We've, we've signed lots of dotted lines, but the conflicts are still there. You know. Yes, Professor. Could you just mention or say a sentence about Iran and giving up weapons? Well, I think Iran's the same. I think basically, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're exactly the same. They, they, were, they are not going to give up weapons because they, they, this may sound terrible, but let me, I mean, the, the point is people have to make choices. And uh, the, the point is, you know, Iran gives up at wep weapons, and then people say, well, what about all the terrorism they're doing around the world? You know, we, somebody has to stand trial, you know. The same with Kim Jong-un. He knows there, there, there are people out there talking all the time about the fact, okay, these people have to, have to stand trial. You know, Alexis Dutton, she would, she would, she would not appreciate me citing her on this because she only mentioned it one time, but I, but, and it was, a, it was a meeting that we had, but she said, there's so much to be learned from how the United States handled Emperor Hirohito after World War II. You know, if you assume, I, I, you know, like Saddam Hussein, I think Saddam Hussein decided he was not going to leave. He, he wasn't interested in going someplace else. He was going to go down with the ship. And I don't know if that was the case with, with Gaddafi, but potentially the same, you know. Some people will leave. Some people will not leave. I think it's a mistake to assume that Kim Jong-un would leave. I think the whole honor and dignity of the Kim line is there, you know. And likewise, I, I, I think in terms of Iran, it's the same. Basically, uh, if they get rid of their weapons, you know, there has to be a broader agreement that doesn't just deal with one, that, that specific thing. And it's complex. And conflict transformation in that case may take a long, long time. So you have to live very long, Professor Lerman. You know, so. <laughs> yep. Yes? Do you think that if those who want Iran um, uh, Korea to give up their weapon, you know? If they first give them up, they are stone up, you know. Would they would that encourage them to give up? Uh, well you <laughs> I guess I guess <laughs> you're you're definitely at, once you give them up, you're at a disadvantage, right? But I'm not i I'm not saying because then you have to they, then they have the weapons but you don't have them. But do I th do I think do I think that there, there needs to be a discussion in terms of addressing this universally? Yes, absolutely. It's not, it's, not, it's not fair for some people to say, okay, we, we, we have weapons. Why? Because we're the good people. We're the good people, you know. That's, that, that, that doesn't make sense. The, the, uh, the dialogue has to go further than that. So your question is the right question, you know. Uh, and uh, I, don't ha I don't have a simple answer for it, but I do know that that's part of the process because that's part of the problem, you know. It's, it's like a, um, one, one, one of my friends who, you know, who knows Korean culture very well, he says, you know, that uh, North Korea will never give up their weapons because they've joined the elite. They're part of the elite now. They have nuclear weapons, you know, like the United States and China and, you know, they're, they're part of the elite. So they, they don't want to give up that. It makes them special. So you can't just look at 
those countries, so to, so to speak, and you, you have to look at the whole. So you're, you're on target, I agree. Uh, talking about the role of religion. Yes. Uh, second diplomacy. If I remember very well, I think it was Pope John Paul II or Pope Francis who called on that, that to resolve that problem, every nation should give up. Mm -hmm. Either Pope Francis or a top-ranking officer or personnel in Rome, in mm -hmm. Vatican said that. But many nations were up in arms against that. Right. Well, you, I mean, you, you need a very clear process. I mean, I think the beginning point, that might be a project for ISERM, is how do you begin the process of doing that, you know? So, a clear process, protocols, yeah. Uh, sorry, another question, um, it's from Stephen. He's asking, is there a place for track to diplomacy in the current relationship between DPRK and the West? What advice would you offer in the current circumstances? Uh, there's, it's the only thing that there is right now. We definitely have to have, we, the, and, 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 and organizations like the Graham Organization, the Moon Organization, um, maybe, I, I don't know, there's, uh, there's some Catholic charities and things that are involved. Those, those organ, that, that work continues, and, and it's important that it continues. Yeah. Well, Dr. Thomas, um, on behalf of the International Center for Ethno-Religious Mediation, um, on behalf of our board of directors, uh, we have uh, a oh. token of appreciation uh, to present to you. When I told them that you were going to keynote this conference, uh, the first thing, uh, first question was, does he practice a scholarship of engagement? Mm -hmm. And from your presentation and the work you've done uh, in many places, as well as leading the uh, theological seminary, Unification Theological Seminary uh, in New York City, uh, building and training interfaith leaders, uh, I think uh, you deserve uh, to be given the ISRM Honorary Award. So it is my pleasure uh, to present the ISRM Honorary Award uh, to Dr. Thomas Ward in recognition of your outstanding contributions of major significance to global peace and development. Thank you very much. Thank you.